I hope we can finish uh, three hours. Yeah. We'll do something. Finish the uh, last economics uh, micro bit. So as, as I, I said last time, that uh, Marshall, which is the founder, he founded contempt what is contemporary micro microeconomic theory. They don't refer to Marshall. It has become part of the textbooks. Yeah, they do refer to the Marshallian supply and demand approach. Now, as I said last time, Alfred Marshall, he both rejected general equilibrium because he did not think that it was remotely possible to make any practical, to get to any practical conclusion, operational conclusion from general equilibrium because general equilibrium uh, aims at finding the existence simultaneously, simultaneously in all markets, okay, in a consistent manner, the existence of a price, or rather a set of prices, which in mathematics is called price vector, because it's a set of prices, which clear the set of prices are supposed to is supposed to clear all the markets, okay? So to generate a general equilibrium in the system. Marshall did not think that that was uh, possible. And even if it was possible, it would have remained possible at a purely theoretical, metaphysical level, not in any operational sense. And he also rejected the Jeevan's weak steam. Uh, view that you do not have to consider production at all because anyway production is derived from demand <coughs> follow? and demand comes from utility that is to say if you have a, a preference for a product for a good the, that preference will generate demand for that good and then therefore uh, there will be entrepreneurs etc who will start producing that good that was the view of Jevons weak seed and stuff like that. He also rejects that. Well, that's too that's too extreme, too far fetched. What, 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 we should not jump Ricardo in that particular in that way. So he went back to the position of of uh, John Stuart Mill. John Stuart Mill wanted to introduce the notion of utility into the termination of prices, but at the same time retaining some of Ricardo's uh, analysis of production. The strength of the classical approach of, to production is that it is objective. You follow me? It is, ob it is objective. It's not dependent upon subjective conditions. It's objective uh, 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 defined. So, so what Marshall did, he he did many things, by the way. I mean, this is a the, the purely theoretical <coughs> core of his approach, which is only a minor, it's a, it, it's a small part of his book. It's not a big part. But this is what has become part of the text. So what Marshall did is uh, he uh, developed what has become known as partial equilibrium, not general equilibrium. Partial equilibrium. That is by looking, so first I'll explain in, in words, then I'll put the, the graphs, the diagrams on the board. That is by looking at the situation of the individual firm, which he called the representative firm. Do you follow me? The representative firm is the firm that is supposed to be representing the whole firm, the whole system of firms in, in the economy. So the typical firm, so to speak. The representative firm is the typical firm. The 
firm within the industry. You follow? That is a firm uh, producing, I don't know, producing socks that's within the, the sector, the branch producing socks. Do you understand? Of shirts and so forth. A firm within the industry. The position of the firm within the industry. Then he looked at the position of the industry, the position of the industry in the economy, and he called it the representative industry. Do you understand? So he moved from the typical firm to the typical industry. So he, he thought that if you could picture the economy in terms of a typical firm, number one, and the typical industry within which the firms operate, then you would be in a position to say something meaningful. You understand? Because you take the typical, typical means that you can that you can generalize. You understand? But you are not then you are not constrained by the simultaneous determination of the results, which would be the case in general equilibrium. You need millions and millions of equations to simultaneously determine the result, and you will not be constrained by that. You proceed step by step. And this is why it's called partial equilibrium. Equilibrium of the firm within the industry, equilibrium of the industry within the economy. That's why it's called partial. You see, it's not general equilibrium, it's partial. That is, that is Marshall approach. And that's the approach that we made in textbooks. Okay, so you have in contemporary uh, textbooks, you have essentially two levels. You have one level, and that is the level where policy, which is used for policy, because it's, it's the, the simplest possible level. And that is the partial equilibrium approach. You follow? Then, you have the metaphysical level. That's the general equilibrium approach. General equilibrium approach, which is, cannot be used in any form of policy. Okay? Cannot be used. This is high theology. So that's what it is. Can you take it back, please? Yeah? Can you come back again, please? On what? On the two levels. The two levels. One level is the is the partial equilibrium, the Marshallian partial equilibrium, which is used essentially even if this is what make, makes its way in policies. And this will see its true also in macroeconomics. And <coughs> the second level is general equilibrium. General equilibrium is a is a is a very metaphysical level because general equilibrium means that it gives you an answer for the existence of general equilibrium in all markets simultaneously everywhere. Okay, simultaneously everywhere. So that's really high theology. It's the difference between if you are in a Catholic country, in a Catholic country, you have the priest in the village, okay? The priest in the village has to you cannot ask the priest in the village whether Jesus Christ existed or not, you know, because it's almost sure that he did not exist. You know, that Jesus Christ did not exist. It's a, an invention. You know, it's a, it's a, you know, that, yes, it did not exist. There were many kind of people claiming to be sort of Jesus Christ in those in, in, in those years in, in, in Palestine. You know, it's always the same place. You know. And and uh, it's the same thing that was found, you know, in, the, in, the, in relation to Jewish history. Israeli archaeologists, they found out that most of the Bible is false. There was never, Moses did not exist. There was never, I'd be burned right away by every religion. Right away they will put me, <laughs> because if you tell the Muslims that, that Moses did not exist, that's that's a, a total blasphemy, and if you tell uh, the Christians, well, they don't, well, that's secondary. It's 
not real. It's Jesus, the most important businessman in this room. Uh, 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 but it's been found that most of the stories of the Bible, all of the Bible, where David, King David, did not exist. King David did not exist. Okay, so. It's a construction, it's a fairy day. Why do well, you have to look at the history of Babylon, of the Babylonian Empire, and, and, stuff, uh, and, and this pop the population, this religion that was formed from within the Babylonian Empire called, called uh, Judaism, called Jew yeah, Judaism. So, so you ask, but you ask the priest, look, you know, can you tell me about the existence of existence of God, the existence of Jesus, which is a complicated existence, eh? because it's God, Son, Father, everything. So, uh, and, uh, so uh, it's, it's a complicated existence. Therefore, the priest said, look, don't ask me these questions. I, pick, uh, I, have, I have different problems here, okay? Don't ask me about the existence. And then go to, I don't know, Rome, go to, to uh, a big, uh, a big university, Catholic university, you know, Sorbonne, before the French Revolution, uh, uh, when there, there were theolog theological institutions, or, or Cambridge, or Oxford, or Cambridge, they were all religious institutions that were set up for sort of this kind of purposes. Uh, go, but don't ask me, the priest, you know, the priest in uh, some mountains around here, etc., or in the middle of Italy, don't ask me about. I have different problems. I have problems I have to make sure that the shepherds that go with the sheep onto the mountains don't have sexual relations with the sheep. So this is my problem here, okay? <laughs> so, so don't ask me as a so partial equilibrium. Eh? What? I mean, sexual assault is a bigger problem in the U.S. church years now. <laughs> So, yeah, but, but I'm talking about, so the priest, <laughs> I'm, talking, I'm, talking, I'm talking about the atavistic sense. Yeah? And so, and I, if I have to make sure that people here, you know, don't, don't confuse things a bit. You know, that, and this is passion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? and, and general equilibrium is when you get in some bone in the big, you know, I'm talking about the Middle Age institutions, University of Bologna, whatever, but they talk about the big theological things. And out of big theological things came, you know, both positive and negative things. So out of big theological discussion came Copernicus. Hmm? And uh, before him, just slightly before him, when they knew each other, it was Giordano Bruno, who they absolutely <coughs> Had no problems in burning him up in the in the public in a public square in Rome. If you go to Rome, there is a statue, uh, Campo di Fiori. There is a statue to Giordano Bruno, okay, which was a philosopher pre-Copernican. I mean, he actually had relations with Copernicus, and he actually lectured in some of the Protestant universities. And in Rome, they picked him up and burned him. You no. Know, Galileo Galilei, it's also the, but it's where the results of both scientific, theological and scientific discussion. So they, the big things must come from there, they don't come from the priest. Huh? The practical things come from the priest, you understand? The practical thing don't have to do with the big theories, they have to do with the fact that people should not confuse animals with uh, sex and stuff like that. Okay. <clears throat> and so, uh, Marshall is partial equilibrium. Okay, that's what Marshall is. And that's what made its way into textbook. But then if you go to PhD classes and stuff like that, uh, say, uh, and not even everywhere, but say MIT, Harvard, Cambridge, uh, Oxford, Stanford, and that's about it. Uh, you get general equilibrium when you go when you go for the PhD, when you go for for um, for PhD courses. Marshall retained Ricardo. He wanted to retain a theory of production, but he modified it. In Ricardo, 
and Marx and Adam Smith, there are no diminishing returns. You understand? <clears throat> Industrial production is either constant returns, which means constant productivity. You understand? Constant returns means constant productivity. Which means that, for instance, if I think of increasing output by 10%, you make the assumption that the increase in output is brought about at the same rate of productivity. You follow me? You expand the economy by linearly by 10%. Yeah. Or, as it was strongly the case in Adam Smith, it's by increasing returns. Namely, you, if you output increases at diminishing cost, <coughs> you follow me, you get productivity increases. If you expand output, you have greater division of labor, you have greater productivity. You understand? So, in Adam Smith, is actually uh, is actually uh, increasing returns, diminishing costs. For Marshall, output increases, any expansion in output is at increasing marginal cost. You follow me? So that if you expand output by 10%, Cost will expand by more than 10%. Okay? It's increasing marginal cost. Where does he get the increasing marginal cost? The increase in the marginal cost, he, de he takes it from Ricardo, but not from Ricardo, Ricardo had the view, but Ricardo did not talk about increasing marginal cost, okay? So he modifies something from Ricardo, which I will tell you now. In Ricardo, as <coughs> accumulation, as growth takes place, you, it's always Malthusian theory of population in Ricardo, right? So if you have growth, you have increasing population. If you have increasing population, you have to bring more food into, uh, into the economy. And uh, to bring more food, you need to cultivate more, more land. Mm -hmm. okay? So you start from the most fertile land to the, best. to the less fertile land. Do you understand? So less, less fertile land means that it yields less produce. Mm -hmm. you know? mm. This is the diminishing it's not diminishing returns, it's diminishing fertility of land, in diminishing productivity or fertility of land in the case of Ricardo. It does not affect price. The value of a commodity is always determined by the quantity of labor time necessary to produce it. Okay? What it affects the diminishing fertility of land is the position, the relationship between the rent and profit. That's what it, the first plot of land, in, because in Ricardo, rent is differential rent. If you read the Pasinetti paper that I put on Moodle, uh, you, 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 you will see the part on Ricardo. The first plot of land is uh, no rent, okay? because that's the only plot of land that produces okay, no rent. The second plot of land will produce less. So. The difference between the first and the, and the second plot of land, so if the first plot of land produces 100 whatever kilograms of something, the second produces 80, rent is 20. Okay? That's the rent, so it's a differential rent. The last plot of land, no rent. You follow? And what happens in this, because wages are, are fixed, wages are fixed, because they are fixed in subsistence, they cannot be they cannot fall below subsistence. Otherwise, the system dies, yeah? because you get a Malthusian population situation in the reverse. Okay. So this means that the population will be asymptotically tend to zero. As a result, wages for consistency, wages 
are fixed subsistence, and as you expand the cultivation of the land into less fertile plot of land, eventually, because you keep wages, <coughs> nothing will be left for profit. You understand? There will, no, there will be no room for net profit. And, but there is no, this diminishing fertility of land, diminishing productivity of land, is just, does not reflect in regard to increasing cost of production. It reflects changes in the distribution of income. Co the cost of production is determined by the quantity of labor time necessary to produce commodity. That's it. it what Marshall does, it takes from the Cardo <coughs> the principle of diminishing fertility of land and applies it to production in the firm, as well as in the industry, applies it to the production conditions of the firm, and links it to price. That's what he does. You follow? In regard of diminishing fertility of land, therefore differential rent does not affect prices. Prices are determined by the quantity of labor time, by the labor theory of value, as in Marx. They are determined by the amount of labor time necessary to produce commodities. Diminishing fertility of land affects only the position of rent, rent and profits. That's what it affects, the distribution of income. With Marshall, you have the principle of diminishing productivity of land applied to industry, to the firm. So the firm, the industrial firm, is subjected to the diminishing, product, diminishing marginal productivity. Diminishing productivity as output increases, productivity diminishes on, at the margin. This is, and this affects prices, because it affects the cost of production. Therefore, in, in In Riccardo, in, uh, in Riccardo, if you want to make Riccardo into a sort of model, an old classics, this is price and this is quantity. The cost of production is either constant, so this is the cost, production or even diminishing, but I assume it to be constant, okay? So there is no limit to the scale of production. You understand there is no limit. And if demand, say if the individual firm faces a infinite <coughs> demand curve, why is that the individual firm faces an infinite demand curve? Because it's too small relatively relatively to the market. So the market is infinite for the individual firm. You can see that there is no limit to output. Okay, that's the cost. That is the uh, demand curve, which is infinite for the firm. The difference would be the profit, okay, because this determines the price here. The difference will be the profit. There is no limit. It can be infinite. It's only determined by the state of demand, by the state of aggregate, of general demand. And in fact, the classics did not set a limit to output. They did not set a limit to output. They only analyze the composition, the parts, the distribution of income, but they did not set a particular input and, and uh, 
and um, what's his name? Ricardo said we can. He actually said that it is possible to ascertain the distribution of income, the laws governing the distribution of income between profits, wages, and rent with precision. It is not possible to determine with precision what the level of output will be. Okay? That's what Ricardo stated it very, very clearly. So the classes were focused on the distribution of income not at the on the, not at the, they did not analyze, they did not develop a theory of the absolute level of output, of the level, of what determines the level of output. Well, this is what Marshall did, okay, in a neoclassical term. So, Marshall assumed that every firm faces an infinite demand curve. So that becomes the definition of competition in neoclassical economics, where firms are too small, so small relatively to the market, so there are many, 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 many firms, okay, you follow me? Because if you are small, General Motors or Volkswagen is not small relatively to the market, you know? You understand? Yeah, this is called oligopoly, where you have a definite number <coughs> of firms, okay? Because what Volkswagen does affects what uh, Toyota does. So what Toyota does affects what Volkswagen directly and they know. Hmm? So this is uh, not the case. Because you cannot say that the automobile market is made of an infinite number of firms. In the case of Marshall, the market is made of an infinite, of a very, very large number of firms. And this becomes the definition of competition in neoclassical economics. In neoclassical economics, competition is like you have many infinite number of consumers that don't, they don't influence each other. They interact, but they don't influence each other. Do you follow me? Uh, they interact through the market. The same thing, at the level of production, you have an infinite number of producers. Yes? who are impotent relatively to the market. So they are price takers. So in classical economics, the definition of competition is free mobility of capital. Free mobility of capital. In neoclassical economics, the definition of competition is not necessarily free mobility of capital. It is the very, very large number of firms. Okay? It's atomistic firms. In fact, there are infinite numbers of firms that are very small relatively to the market, and therefore they are all price takers. They are not price makers, they are price takers. They take the price of the market. So this means that a, a, a neoclassical firm A neoclassical firm would face an infinite demand curve. Because the firm by itself cannot influence uh, the price. The firm is a price taker, it is not a price maker. But so how does the firm determine the quantity? It produces on the basis of the cost of production. The cost of production has to somehow meet the demand curve. Okay? And this is the solution. So this is the supply curve of the firm. And this is the infinite demand curve of the firm. This will be the equilibrium price. And corresponding to the equilibrium price, there is an equilibrium level of output. Okay? So this is equilibrium price. This is equilibrium output for the firm. 
You follow? Why is that the supply, the, the supply uh, upward slope? Why don't we have a supply curve which is like this, for instance? Huh? Because it has to be logically, for this theory to be consistent, upward sloping. Because otherwise, you will not meet the demand curve. You, you must cross the demand curve, otherwise you don't determine the equilibrium position of the firm. You follow? Mm -hmm. So it has to be upward sloping. And what is the rationale of upward sloping? Is that this is derived from the cost conditions, from the cost of production. So the firm is assumed to have Uh, uh, to face a certain number of factors of production, say an agricultural firm, for instance, would have land as a factor of production, you follow me, which would be called, which is called in neoclassical economics capital, land is like capital, and it would have labor. Okay? So the idea is that if it has to <coughs> increase production, it will have to use one of the factors more intensely. You understand that? So if a firm uses one of the factors more intensely, say it uses land more intensely, it gets diminishing productivity, diminishing fertility of the land. That's what it gets, you see? And this will affect the cost of production in such a way that the S output expands, the marginal cost of production increases. Okay? And this is why the curve is upward and sloping. You understand? That determines the equilibrium position of the curve. How do you obtain this curve? This, this is something that I noticed, which for me is so simple and clear, when I read it the first time, not in Marshall, but in a paper by a person that we will mention uh, during the year. Now we are going to mention it, and then we are going to mention it later on as well. Uh, a person called Piero Sraffa, which has been a who is who was the sort of uh, Eminence Greece at Cambridge. Yeah, Piero Zaffa. Piero Zaffa is a, is, was the son of the founder of the Bocconi University in Milan. Yeah, that was Bocconi University. And he was, it's all, it's all a communist plot. It's very, it's, it's all a communist, like a communist. And, he was one, he was the greatest friend of Antonio Gramsci, the greatest friend of Antonio Gramsci, yeah, and of Togliatti. But mostly because Togliatti was with Gramsci, yeah? but he was completely devoted to Gramsci, completely. And in, he was spotted by Keynes in the early 20s. Keynes organized a special issue of the news, newspaper, the British newspaper, The Guardian, which at that time was called the Manchester Guardian, it was still in Manchester, the, the <coughs> London in the 70s. And uh, 
special issue, a special supplement on, on the bank. Italy was subjected to a big banking crisis yeah, after the First World War because of the Berlusconi nature of Italy. You know, and, uh, <laughs> and, and so the, the big like the Banca Commerciale, they expanded credit to the big steel industries to produce for the war, etc., etc. And after the war, when all this uh, uh, when the demand to sustain all that stuff was not there, those big banks went into, into financial difficulties. You know, big financial difficulties. They started grabbing money from government, from this, from that, and all that. Also. And um, Zlafa wrote an article in 1922, which was published in the Economic Journal, which is on the banking crisis in Italy. That was spotted by, by uh, Keynes, and in 1924, Keynes asked uh, Zlafa to write an article, a more, more journalistic article, on, therefore, more direct article on the banking financial crisis in Italy, which Zlafa did. This article, 1924, okay, 1924, Mussolini was already in power. Therefore, this article really annoyed Mussolini a lot, okay? And, and Zaffa got onto a train and went to Italy. That's what happened, okay? That's what happened, he left Italy, essentially. He left Italy, and in England, Keynes basically hired him at Cambridge, uh, in Cambridge. He hired him, not as a lecturer, because he did not want to lecture. He did not want to lecture. He was hired as a librarian. He was all his life a librarian at the University of Cambridge, librarian in the Department of Economics at the Marshall, which later was named after Marshall Day, the Marshall Library. That was Rafa. Okay. Zafa Keynes, Keynes was Keynes was very English, right? So he had this kind of one-line humor that he could <laughs> produce. So, um, and Keynes defines Zaffa as the person from whom nothing is hidden, nothing escapes, because he had a very sharp uh, logical mind, very, very sharp logical mind, Zaffa. And he wrote very little in his life, very little. But every time he wrote, there were, you know, then hundreds of articles. He opened up a Pandora box and generated. And he, he, he wrote very little. And he will not get permanent position today in universities because he, he did not have much publications. He wrote the first article that he wrote, a uh, theoretical article, was in Journal de l'Economiste in 1925. And then, uh, a shorter version of it was published in the Economic Journal in 1926, which is. I have an amnesia now. It's. Uh, uh, I, I will tell you because I have it in my. In my I have the whole article on my computer. The laws of return and something. Okay. The 1925 and the 1926 article is a discussion of the supply curve. That's what it is. And he basically demolished, uh, demolished much. He demolished much. So it is to say, what Zafa pointed out is that, but it is in March, actually, because I went back to check with the March of it, is that the to have this such a supply curve, you must make an assumption, an assumption which is that what the firm does, you see this is the single firm, you understand? What the firm does, does not affect the other firms. You follow? You understand? That, that If, if a firm wants to use more of a factor, say, if an agricultural firm wants to use more 
of a fact of land, for instance. Okay? If, if it, in order to expand production, if it wants to use more of a fact, then what the firm, that the action of that firm should not affect the other firms operating on the, uh, agricultural firms operating on the land using the same factor. You follow? And um, the other thing which is connected to that is that if the firm um, that the firm should be impermeable, should be should not have should not be subject to increases in productivity. So only if you can isolate the activity of the firm from all the other firms, then you can think of such an upward sloping supply. But that's what we pointed out, that it is most unlikely that the activity of a firm will not affect the other firms. Or to, look, to be more specific, an activity of the firm may not affect all the other firm. Listen to this. If the activity itself is irrelevant. You see, because this activity, say, the activity of the firm to expand, to use more land, okay, to use more land. If the use of more of more of a factor would only increase the cost of production for the firm that uses more of the factor. In that case, it gets more of the factor land, but it has to use labor more intensely. So <coughs> it is subject to an increase in the cost of labor. Okay. Uh, it should not. This will leads to the upper sloping curve, but. In order not to be affecting the other firm, it has to be insignificant. The, 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 the absolute impact should be insignificant, and therefore there is no reason to have an upper sloping, an upper sloping curve. If you want to make it significant, then it will affect the position of all the other firms as well, and you cannot have this story whereby you take the firm in isolation. You understand? So that's how you demolish it. All right, let's go back to 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 to, uh, to Marshall. So Marshall comes to me. So sure, now this is just to tell you what we think of Zara. But now we are going back. So at the level of the individual, at the level of the firm, we establish. Assuming that the activity of the firm does not affect impact on the other firms, you establish a position of equilibrium between supply, between uh, the demand curve and the supply condition. Okay? Why this is Now we move to the industry level. We have the same thing. We have the same thing. We have the same framework. It's no longer the small, 
it's no longer the individual firm facing an infinite demand curve. You understand? It's no longer the individual firm being atomistically very small in the market. It's all the industry. So you aggregate it together, all the firms. And this means that the, all the firms, they face a finite demand curve, not an infinite demand curve. And this finite demand curve will be down the slope. Okay? And that is the equilibrium between supply and demand for you follow? No, can you repeat uh, the objective of this number? Okay, in the in the in the single in, in the single firm case you have an infinite demand curve, okay, here are prices and cost, because the firm is supposed to be infinitely small infinitesimally small relatively to the market, okay? So are millions of firms, they don't affect it. Therefore, and they each operate under increasing marginal cost, and you have the equilibrium at the level of the firm, this is the level of the firm. Okay? That's everything you When you, that's the firm within the industry, you can take it says socks, a firm producing socks within the industry, you find the industry, the socks industry, and that's the point. When you put the entire industry together, that is all the socks, then you cannot, then you no longer have an infinite demand curve. You look at the whole industry. You look at the whole industry. You retain the assumption that the industry produces under increasing marginal cost. They still they, each firm in the industry produces under these conditions, okay? So, the industry produces under increasing marginal cost, you follow? Mm -hmm. But the industry will not have an infinite demand curve, because it's the industry, you, you, it's the whole sector, therefore the demand curve will be downward, sloping, okay? Th that's what it is. The downward sloping demand curve reflects the fact that the whole population will have is subject to the law, the whole the consumers also operate the consumers' preference, they generate downward sloping demand curve. Okay, the law of demand for the consumers. The equilibrium of the consumer is given by the relationship between the marginal utility of one product over the marginal utility of another product, okay? Well, this is what defines the downward sloping demand curve because the marginal utility is diminishing, okay? Therefore, the principle of diminishing marginal utility determines the downward sloping demand curve. For the index of as a whole, therefore for SOPs, the the whole industry will face a finite and downward sloping demand curve, and this determines the relationship between supply and demand for the industry. And this determines the equilibrium, the equilibrium of the industry. Okay? That's the supply, that's supply and demand. This is called the representative firm. This is called the representative industry. Do you understand? And the idea is that this industry, well, you apply this analysis, that's why it's still partial equilibrium, okay? It's partial equilibrium for the firm here, partial equilibrium of the industry within the economy. For the firm. around it there is the whole economy. But you apply this criteria, okay? You apply to each of the industries. So you can apply it to the steel industry, you apply it to the automobile industry, you apply to the bicycle, bicycle industry, you apply to whatever industry you choose, you apply this framework here. Okay? So basically the general equilibrium of the economy is just a series of industry equilibria in the case of, of Marshall. So this is called the representative industry case. This is called the representative firm case. You understand? 
in the, in, 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 in the Marchelian framework. What happens here is that it means that each industry, and that's why the story ends for, for Marshall, each industry has to be treated in isolation from all the other industries. Exactly like each firm here is treated in isolation from all the other firms. So you make this here, the assumption is that what the firm does does not affect all the other firms. The, the assumption here is what the industry does does not affect all the other industries. This is a very strong assumption, right? It, for the industry, it is impossible to think that what the automobile industry does will not affect aluminium and steel. Hmm? The understand? This is a bit, or what the construction industry does would certainly affect what the cement and concrete industry uh, does. So this is a very, very strong assumption that you can take the industry in isolation from all the other, uh, other industries. Okay? But only under these assumptions you can have increasing marginal cost. Okay? Upward slope in supply. Now, how is the price determined here? What is the point in which the price for the firm uh, crosses the infinite demand curve? This point is the point where marginal costs are equal to prices. You see, here, okay, marginal costs are still below the are still below this point here. But because the firm is under competition, it has to maximize output. And it will maximize output the point in which marginal costs are equal to prices. You understand? But this also means, this is another aspect, that what are profits in this firm? What are the profits? If Marginal costs are equal to prices. Where are the profits? Because firms assume under competition to maximize output <coughs> up to the point in which prices are, are equal to marginal costs. Therefore, there are no profits. There are no profits. Hmm? Which is, profits don't, don't show up in these things. But Marshall was, as I said, was really. British and therefore English in particular, and he was very practical. And so he knew that that was a bit of a thing. So he said, well, this includes what he called normal profits. The normal profits become part of the marginal cost, so to speak. Okay? No, 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 normal profits, nobody knows what normal profits are, but normal profits, okay? Normal profits. But that's what uh, that's how he got by the, this problem of the fact that costs are equal to prices, but where are the profits for the firm? But these costs include also, also normal profits. It's part of the cost, okay? The normal profits are part of the cost of that. Uh, and the upper sloping margin costs. This is what you get in textbooks today. So, Assume that one, so a, that a firm has two factors of production, okay? land and labor. Yeah, that's what we usually assume. Or, as they say, capital and labor. It's the same thing, because capital and land are treated as being synonymous. If the firm has two factors of production, yeah, you can add, if you like, other factors of production as well. And for whatever reason, it's important that I say whatever reason. Every now and then I say whatever reason. Which is say, we start with a situation of equilibrium, I sort of inject something that changes this equilibrium. 
So for whatever reason, one factor of production becomes cheaper than another. Hmm? Well, let's say labor. Let's say. So if one factor of production becomes cheaper, it means that the cost of labor becomes cheaper relatively to the cost of capital. That's what it means, right? That's what it means. So if labor becomes cheaper, you should therefore expect this curve to shift, you understand? You start from this and it becomes cheaper. It stretches outwards. Okay? <coughs> and you have for the same price, of course. You have <coughs> a new level or a new equilibrium. A new equilibrium which entails greater output and lower a lower cost for the factor that has become cheaper in that case lower wages which means also because output has increased has expanded also more employment you understand this is the principle this is why in contemporary textbooks, the always textbook policy makers, they always tell you the story that cheaper labor would increase employment. It comes from that, that if labor becomes cheaper, employment increases. You hear it everywhere, okay? Everywhere. For the industry, it's the same thing. The industry, that, okay? And this would mean a shift in the demand curve, okay, that from here and the supply curve becomes this one. And here you have another level of output of the industry at this point, okay, and at a lower price. At the lower <coughs> this, this is the standard approach. Therefore, this standard approach has been, in relation to labor now, I want to focus it, has been embodied in a guy who was the follower, who followed, who followed Marshall, when Marshall was dead. Because Marshall became professor at Cambridge University, I don't know, I don't remember, 1880 80 something, and he stayed as head, he founded the Department of Economics, he stayed as head of the Department of Economics till he was dead, okay, till 1923. No, perhaps he died in 1923 and no, he became, he stayed, he appointed the, the successor. And the successor was another person very well, who became very well known in, in economics. He is, um, he is, I don't, I, no one mentioned his first name, so I don't remember the first name. Uh, because he's, he's never met, he's Pigou. Pigou, Pigou, very important, right? the Pigou effect is very important, Pigou. Uh, he became the head of the economics department at Cambridge afterward. And Pigou, in 1912, he wrote a book, a booklet called The Theory of Employment, and in which he develops really the classical, the neoclassical, sorry, the neoclassical view of unemployment. That's what, and in, in the Marshallian Pigou approach, he was a student of Marshall, a student follower of Marshall. Uh, labor is exactly like, in the market, labor is exactly like any other commodity, like oranges, uh, it's traded in the market, okay? So, here is labor, and here is the price of labor, which is the wage, 
Okay? Therefore, you would have for the economy, the industry in this case is labor, the industry, and it will face a down, downward sloping demand curve for labor and an upward sloping supply curve of labor. This means that you have one equilibrium point for wages, this will be the full employment equilibrium point, right? Because at this point supply and demand for labor, for employment are equal. Eh? And then you can have any other combination above, above that or below. If here wages are on the direct spot, you can see that uh, there will be unemployment due to the fact that, okay, due to the fact that um, wages are too high. Okay? You follow? The, the, four, the equilibrium point between wages and supply and demand for labor is here. To have a uh, uh, if wages are here, you can see immediately that the level of employment is below what would be the equilibrium point between supply and demand. Okay? So, in this case, unemployment would be determined by wages being too high. Okay? Given the supply and demand curve, mm -hmm. you have to reduce wages. That's, and that is the neoclassical story about the labor market. Then they can argue all sorts of things, you know, to make it a bit more complicated by saying, okay, well, that's too simplistic. Um, they will say Stiglitz, for instance, Joseph Stiglitz, who comes from this framework, say, well, yeah, folks, that's too simplistic. The reason why wages are not equilibrium <coughs> wages is because there are informational symmetries. There is also the blah, blah, blah. But essentially, the, um, the story is that in lab for labor, it's very important because this gets us to case very quickly. For labor, <coughs> it's very important is that any disequilibrium in the market, if you have, if you have unemployment or if you have also uh, goods which are not being sold is because the price is not right. If the price is not right because it tends to be higher than the equilibrium would require. Okay? That's, that's, that's why the supply and demand story became so important in policy formulations and so forth because it gives you a very, very straightforward and wrong and wrong view of the things. This is wrong. This is wrong. We talk, this is wrong. It's wrong. Okay? It's like saying that the earth is flat. It's exactly the same thing. It is wrong. Okay? Right. But to understand some we have to move to another thing, which I will do after the break. Okay. Now, just one one thing. I have a friend in Sydney who is taken about he wrote a thesis on Marshall, which was published by Palgrave in two volumes by Palgrave Pal Macmillan just a few months ago. Two, I have not read the thesis. Yeah, but I talked to him. Yeah, so that's that's a kind of German type thesis because of the, not now Germany of the 19th century because it took it took him 15 years 
to write this thesis. 15 years. So it's now 50 or whatever. It, it, it's, not, it's not young anymore, right? He's now 50, he just finished his PhD. He was teaching, but he was very good person, and, and, uh, and therefore they, they gave him a position in the university anyway, even without a PhD. He was writing this, this kind of uh, masterpiece uh, PhD, which is on Marshall. Uh, on Marshall. And, uh, and apparently, uh, what, uh, apparently, it, it is going to change the perspective over Marshall. That is to say, what he argues is that the supply and demand story is not Marshall. That's what he argues. Okay? So what in the textbook is presented as Marshallian supply and demand, Neil, he argues that this is not Marshall, that in Marshall there were very limited elements of that, that Marshall was an evolutionary economist, which is true, there are a lot of things of evolutionary aspect in Marx. That, that I knew. But what is strictly denied is negates, is the fact that this is Marshall construction. What he argues is that it's Pigou, that it's a Pigou re, uh, reconstruction of Marshall and transforming Marshall into an orthodox economist that Marshall was not. That's the, the strong point of the thesis. My elderly friend, Jeff Harcourt, Jeff Harcourt, Jeff Harcourt is a guy who was promised in his 83, 84. Uh, <coughs> no, nearly 85, actually. You know. And he then was from Adelaide. I, didn't even know that they would end up in Australia when he was in Adelaide. Okay. Uh, but, um, and he moved to Cambridge, became uh, a member of Jesus College, Cambridge, and uh, he's of the same company of Toporowski and all this, <laughs> the same band, basically. And, and uh, he uh, says that is now after he retired from Cambridge, as he went to, to got the pension from Cambridge, okay, came back to Australia, and he's a honorary professor at the uh, University of New South Wales, Jeff. And Jeff says that Neil Hart book is the most important, it's a completely, absolutely path-breaking book, etc. So I, since I will not read Jeff, I will not read, I already decided that I'm not going to uh, bother with uh, uh, whether Marshall was Marshall or was somebody else. Uh, um, and I'm interested <coughs> in criticizing, in critiquing textbooks rather than Marshall, okay? That one. But uh, I, I believe, I trust Jeff, and I also trust Lee uh, and Art, and they say, okay, so to you I tell the textbook, they present it as Marshall, but people who, are, who have been working into these things, they say it is not Marshall. The last point is that who? But Zrafa says it's Marshall. Right? Okay. But this is where the communist plot comes. Yeah? <laughs> this is, because they say that it is Zrafa that has a Stalinist operation, Stalinist maneuver relatively to Marshall that Zrafa set up Marshall as the enemy, so to speak, yeah? and uh, ascribed it to Marshall. That, that's what he did, in order to demolish, because Pigou was the, considered himself to be the Marshall appointed him as the best, was his best pupil in, in, in Cambridge, appointed him as successor. And so, in order to demolish Pigou, he, Demolished, uh, Ma he demolished Marshall. That's what, that's what the rumor is. Okay, and that was, that was, that was. why I say it's a communist plot because, because in the 1926-1925 Italian paper, which is a long journal of economics, it's a very long paper on the relationship between cost and quantity relazioni tra costo e quantità prodotte, which was then 
reproduced in an abridged version in the Economic Journal in 1926, Marshall comes to the conclusion that all this is logically bunk, okay, and he's right. It's logically completely crap, okay? And because you cannot have the upward sloping supply curve. Okay? Therefore, you cannot have the notion of competition based on, on, on neoclassical economics. Because the neoclassical economics notion of competition is consumers operate under diminishing marginal utility, Pro, uh, and firms or producers operate under increasing marginal cost. Okay, but you cannot have you cannot have increasing marginal cost in any meaningful way in uh, neoclassical economics. You cannot have it because if you have, then you either make them insignificant, okay, uh, or if they are not insignificant, they demolish themselves because they will affect what the other firms do. So you cannot keep this isolation dimension. So you cannot have diminishing margin. Therefore, Marsh, what Rafa says, see that's important, what Rafa says is, well, if you want competition, if, if, if you want competition, you must have, the only way you can have competition is to go back to the classics, is to go back to the cardboard. That's what Marshall, what Zlaf says. If you want competition, you just, you have to make only the assumption, not the assumption that firms operate under diminishing returns, under, under increasing marginal cost. You only make, you make assumption that there are constant costs, a uniform rate of profit, you follow? But if you have constant cost and uniform rate of profit, like in the classics, from, from, uh, from uh, uh, Adam Smith and Padilla from Ricardo to, Mar to, to, to Marx, these constant prices, uh, and these are quantities, well, demand does not determine output. You follow? Constant cost, you don't have a limit. Demand does, does not determine the uh, uh, individual demand curve, downward sloping, uh, no, sorry, downward sloping, uh, I got to, I got to this. downward sloping demand curve don't determine prices. Don't determine prices. They only determine the level of output, not prices, you follow? Here, prices are not determined. Here, prices are determined by the interaction between supply and demand. Here, there is no interaction between supply and demand in the determination of prices. And this means that the distribution of income is not determined within the price framework, which we will see when we come back from the break now,
been paid on any topics. You've not seen that. No, that was long since before we were, when we were accepted as a student. She wrote this first assignment that in our first class, everyone is supposed to bring the same paid agreement of, on any topic. Yes, I do. Yes, I did you see that. Hmm? You see that. Oh, okay. Hello, guys. Welcome. 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 First, let me talk to the professor and then talk to him. Uh, what I would like for other class that we have for... Uh, the other class will be at... Uh, no, I mean, we have a sense. No, 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 no. Just normal no class. Okay. Will you have the time table? Okay. You have the time table? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. This, this week's time table, the habit. But on the model, you know, I wrote an email to you that anything you want is on the model. That I feel like you have a password and use Okay, then what you will do is you will make uh, an account, you know, then you will introduce it to the model and that's where you can have all the reviews. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, uh, because actually, you know, I told you now how to use it. The problem is that I need to first uh, secure this password and use it in order to. You mean you have to meet the professor or the professor? It's okay. You said? Yeah, no, so you got it. I got it. Now it's in what? archive of, of the Arabic lectures. I want to download these lectures from the BBC archive. But I don't know how to do no, These are all lectures. Yeah. Right click. Right click. Save target so or save me yes. Oh, you got that. <laughs> hey. hey. So how was the party after uh, I have school? Oh, it was good. It, it was, was good. good. Yeah. 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 Hmm. It will not download. This is the other one, of oh, course, I Um, 
there's a problem with uh, the right click. There is sometimes mistakes the right click for the left click. Because if you left click on it, it opens. But uh, do you understand these uh, these lectures? I need a thorough. Not, I, not completely. No. Not me, I am definitely lost, and I'm very worried about this. Mm. I think I would uh, have a look at the lecture notes he uploaded because I think that's maybe explained a bit more clearly. Yeah, maybe. I don't. I haven't had a look at the documents yet, but I expect that. Uh, this one. But, uh, yeah, one of these. I don't know. Just I don't know the how would but this is what I will use to go to, over. To get the yeah. Mm -hmm. I am completely on top of this. I don't understand. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But I just want to know this thing. You understand this? This one? Yes. Is Antonio? No. Antonio. Right. Oh, probably he has gone for lectures of the near.
Ну, а я не
here are the main differences. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. For the physiocrats and for the guardians, maybe they will look at spontaneous behavior of society and the economy. In the sense that, what is this a class or a physiocrat? Are they going to have any practical part of the job? They're all in the main field of classical words, okay? But the physiocrats will be in French. And the card is part of the English classical field. But here, they were trying to understand how things function like like uh, the, the, the classes of the society and the two main blocks of the society. I understood that very well about the social class and the classes. The English when they were My only problem is when we are in the new class. I don't know. I, I don't know what. No. You have to. You have to. What is this? This is my. This is stuff I write. But I only took notes from the first and the second and I was I guess the concert is really going to happen. I like the music. What will happen in the class when you come here? Marshall? 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 These are only... Yeah. No, I'm not going to go. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. When you cannot have time, I wouldn't mind coming to your place and then we have to have the discussion. What are some of you guys there? Yeah, I can see you guys. And we will invite you guys. Tell us. You can invite me. 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 We were talking about getting half an hour today or during this week to clarify some concepts about all of this discourse because we're all lost, I guess, in some issues. Ah, yeah. We have a dear friend. Maybe we could try to set up a minimum level of knowledge that we could all write it piece by piece. But the new form is the same? No, she had some question about it. Saki. Saki. Thank you. Yeah, because my baby is too old. Because it's more than 25. I realize. Yeah, this was a lot. I have to put it here.
wrote in uh, when they addressed uh, internationally, internationally, the whole of you, so they wrote in German, so his stuff is in German, okay? The in Swedish international language, not the Swedish, the international language of the Scandinavians was German, okay? It's not like today everything is American, okay? Yeah, they had, so Italy had this international language French, by and large, you know? Uh, so that was a, and, uh, um, so that has been written in German. But the, his, his preoccupation comes from Malbas and Palais. No, Pixel was a very interesting person, very interesting also. So it's important to understand the uh, philosophy, the point of view, you know, of the people. It's like, can you write about, I don't know, Dante or, I don't know, Shakespeare, Tolstoy? Can you write without knowing about them? You must know about them. Don't, don't, don't just read the, you know, Divine Divina Commedia or War and Peace and without knowing about the personal views of Tolstoy or Dante or Shakespeare. It's impossible, you know. It's difficult with Shakespeare because nobody knows exactly what. But, uh, but, but you must, so the same thing with the, at least the founders of economic ideas, not the current economists, they don't know. Thank you. So, um, Pixel was, uh, he was in jail. So that's a good thing. Yeah? It's good. <laughs> he was in jail because he refused. He, he, he was a very, he was a libertarian. He was already there for divorce, abortion, everything. You know, all that sort of stuff. He was then. I'm talking about end of the 19th century, and he refused to take the oath for the King of Sweden when he he was given the possibility of becoming a professor, he became a professor at the University of Lund, but very late in his life, very late. But it was before he was given that possibility and he refused to say, I swear, I take the oath for the king, he was a publican, so he refused, okay? So, so on all these things, he also ended up in jail, okay? He's one of the greatest, I think he's the greatest of the 19th, uh, of the neoclassical economics, he's big set. Pixel was the greatest. Also because, to the credit of Pixel, he was always aware as he was developing.